feel so elated that you agreed and that you said yes. I've been uh, watching and, and you for ooh, about 14 years since I've been at the university. And one of the highlights of my career is when you said, hey, Don, I'm like, oh, he know my name. So I was super excited that day as a young professional and just watching you grow. And I knew um, the moment that I was awarded this center that I would not do the center any justice if I didn't uh, have the opportunity to sit down with you one on one. Let me say congratulations. Because Thank you so kindly. I think it's great that you were uh, able to compete and be awarded the center. It's good for the institution, good for the community. Yes, sir. And I really appreciate it. That means a lot definitely coming from you. I think it's important that we just listen and that we learn from you. I need for everyone across the country to know that this isn't a fight that just started. Mm -hmm. This is something that people such as yourself, pillars in the community, have been working on. This is who Dr. David Satcher is. And I think that we would be remiss in this center if we did not capture all of that knowledge that you have. So I'm just gonna jump right in it. Um, I sent over my questions. As part of the introduction, I have to say that, you know, it's in, in, in the spirit of full disclosure, I have to tell you that you're truly a hero of mine. Uh, you're a superhero at, for me, my colleagues at the Southeast ATTC, and definitely at Morehouse School of Medicine. And I'm honored to know such a distinguished person as yourself and to be a part of such a distinguished institution. Well, thank You've been you. at the center and at the forefront of so many efforts and initiatives that have paved the way for centers such as the African American Behavioral Health Center of Excellence. You have put it all out there, the civil rights movement, public health policy and practice, in the needs and the rights of underserved population, and getting to the truth about public health and prevention as the Surgeon General. Around the turn of the 21st century, you asked the famous question, what if we had eliminated health disparities in the last century and the numbers of African Americans would not have died in the year 2000? The numbers were staggering. You were trying to tell us at that very moment that these disparities were killing people. Do you ever feel like we're just now hearing that, Dr. Satcher? And do you think that it took the pandemic to bring this about? I guess I'd say yes and no. I think each uh, generation, uh, each new group of people hear things in their own way mm -hmm. because they're lis listening with different ears. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's been heard before, but you bring to the question and to the, to the discussion a new kind of awareness because of your own experience, um, you know, in this whole area of behavioral health, which is really critical. It's really, mm -hmm. but you are you have a sensitivity to that area that's going to be very important for the future. What do you think it would take for us to keep from forgetting, really, just sliding back into complacency after this pandemic? We, we know that there's a lot of awareness that's going on. We know that there's a lot of funding that's being put forward. Well, what do you think it would take for us not to backslide and just forget after the pandemic is over? It will take somebody like yourself mm -hmm. who's continually reminding us, you know, of the magnitude of the problem but also the potential that we have to deal with it in a new way. Yes, sir. Those numbers are one thing, but when you look at it in the context of what we've learned from the pandemic, for example, uh, and all of the changes that have taken place, there's something else again. You know, understanding the role of behavioral health in mm -hmm. how the pandemic affects us, it's very important. Here in the behavioral health field, we have an important perspective, but a very limited perspective. And now we've been blessed with the opportunity to vote this whole center of excellence to eliminate these behavioral health disparities. I, I know that this is gonna be a hard job for us, but it's an important job. And of course, since human beings are not as disconnected parts, eliminating behavioral health disparities goes hand in hand with eliminating health disparities in general. So my question to you is, if we think of eliminating behavioral health disparities for African-Americans as a long journey, where are we? Where in the field as a whole are we on that journey? 
or where do we seem to be from your perspective? I remember when it was not even a part of, of the discussion. So where we are, it, we're much further along than we were in 2000 when we set the goals for Healthy People 2010. Mm -hmm. Healthy People 2010, we only had two goals. One goal was to improve the quality of lives of people as they age. And the other goal was to eliminate disparities in health. Uh, but in, in talking about eliminating disparities in health, we weren't thinking very much about behavioral health and those disparities. And it was after that as Surgeon General that I released the first ever Surgeon General's report on mental health suicide prevention. Mm -hmm. So we're further along than we were but having said that, we have a long ways to go. Yes, sir. And, and what are some new ideas or some innovations that we should be studying? What should I be learning? What should all of us be working toward re replicating? Now I have to talk about the Satcher Health Leadership Institute. Mm -hmm. Because I think um, we decided, uh, I guess it was 2006, that we, we really needed to focus on developing more leadership. Uh, and, and that led us to things like a program for parents, young parents. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we've had over 50 young parents to come to that program. They learn about child development, how the brain develops you know, at, at different stages. Mm -hmm. And so, I think we've, we've started thinking more and asking more questions about how we develop the behavioral characteristics that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're further along, but we have a long ways to go. We had a health policy program in which we wanted people who had finished our um, medical training programs to be able to influence policy in a new way. And you know, you talk about behavioral health. What about the policies that govern behavioral health? You know, what about you know the way we reimburse uh, providers for their work in behavioral health? You know, what about Obamacare and and, and the effort there to really uh, take advantage of that in terms of getting people reimbursed for the work that they do in behavioral health? Those are things that you know were not true just a few years ago mm -hmm. and are not true now in some states. Mm -hmm. Some states um, do not reimburse for, uh, for behavioral health problems. Mm -hmm. and so, But we're changing that gradually, too gradually. So I'm, I'm, I'm saying on the one hand that we've made some significant progress but I hope you also hear me that we have a long ways to go. Yes, sir, I hear you. And I also heard that is very important because collectively as an institution, I think that it's important that the center of excellence, that we collaborate with other entities in the, within the university. I mean, there are a lot of, uh, I know great partners outside of our walls, but there's also strength in Morehouse School of Medicine. And I think okay. that it's important that I sit at the table with the Satchel Leader Health Institute. Thank you so kindly. That's one of the reasons you were able to compete effectively for, for this grant is because uh, you were committed to taking advantage of the resources around you. And there are some here. Yes, sir. Morehouse yeah. School of Medicine. Yes, sir. There are so many areas of disparities, so many policies that need to be repaired or replaced. And there are so many areas of practice that need to change. Speaking in terms of strategy, because I know that you're a strategist, Dr. Satchel. You didn't get to where you are without being a strategist. <laughs> and in terms of urgency, for a young professional, where would you say it would be most effective for me to start? I'm not going to claim, even though I've known you for a while now and, you know, pass you in the hallway, speak to you, I, I won't claim that I know enough about you to answer that question. But I think you're off to a great start when it comes to this area. And uh, not only do I feel that way, of course, but 
Um, I think the people who fund the programs feel that way, That's or you fair. you would not have been funded. But I there there are a lot of resources here, but not just um, at the Morehouse School of Medicine, across the street, Spelman College, Morehouse mm -hmm. College. So there's some resources here that that can really make a difference. I think you bring you bring tremendous you you yourself bring tremendous mm -hmm. a tremendous resource to the Atlanta University Center. Mm -hmm. You know where you have all these institutions that we take for granted, mm -hmm. but um, it can make a difference if if we all put our heads together mm -hmm. and work together. And to answer that question, which you're asking mm -hmm. about the future, mm -hmm. um, we have the ability to make a difference in the future. You know, it was over 50 years ago that I was a student here. Mm. Marion Wright Elliman was a sophomore at Spelman. Otis Moss had just graduated and they announced that they were having a meeting and I decided I would go. Mm -hmm. And that's when the student movement started. Many of us went to jail, went to prison. Um, and yet we were determined that we were going to do well academically. We weren't going to say, well, I went to jail. So that means that you can't expect me to do as well. No, we went to jail and then we came back and competed in the classroom. Mm -hmm. you know, and, but it, so it made us stronger, made us leaders, really. And, mm -hmm. And I don't have to tell you about what Marion Wright Elman has done, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Children's Defense Fund. Mm -hmm. Otis Moss has been one of the great preachers of our time. So we were fortunate. We supported each other. Mm -hmm. uh, we got together and shared ideas, and we were not afraid. In fact, there was even a song deep in my heart, I do believe we are not afraid today. It was a part of the we shall overcome. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. That's that's powerful. And I have a I do have a heart of collaboration. And as mm -hmm. I was writing with our team uh, for this particular grant, uh, that's one of the key words that I continuously wrote in there is that because this is such a a, a long standing issue that one person can't tackle this. You all have done it. And I don't want to reinvent the wheel. I just want to analyze where the gaps are. I want to bring people to the table. And I definitely want to have a spirit of collaboration to make a change. When you think about the future of the overall looking at behavioral health disparities, if you had the wand in your hand, Dr. Satcher, and you were able to tap that wand, what would you want to see around eliminated disparities for African-Americans? Well, one thing I, I was implying is uh, I'd like to see a collaborative effort among the institutions here in the Atlanta University Center because what we have in common, of course, is that we are historically black institutions. Mm -hmm. um, we've been through a lot already together, but we can, we can make a contribution to the country, I think, that nobody else can, can make. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, as I drive along and listen to the uh, WCLK Clark's radio station, mm -hmm. yes, sir. Uh, it's the only search station in Atlanta, and it's at one of the historically black colleges and universities, mm -hmm. because we're the only medical school among, mm -hmm. among the, the institution. We have a lot of potential, mm -hmm. but we just mm -hmm. got to keep fighting. We got to keep writing proposals, by the way, Don. Mm -hmm. uh, menu on on the spot that you, you that you made for us here, but we got to keep it up because mm -hmm. uh, that's how you that's how you win. That's how you make progress. It's amazing that we have it's taken this long for us as a nation to realize the importance of mental health, mm -hmm. and even now as we're dealing with the the uh, pandemic. Um, we keep learning over and over again that unless you deal with the mental health aspects of those disparities, right. and there are there are major mental health disparities. Now in Alzheimer's, when I came into the work, um, the word was that Alzheimer's is not preventive. You can't prevent mm -hmm. it. 
Mm -hmm. uh, it turns out that about 40% of Alzheimer's disease is preventable, mm -hmm. but it depends on things like, you know, how you nurture the brain, physical activity, good nutrition. Mm -hmm. And so now we say 60% of Alzheimer's is, is, is uh, not preventable. But I think as time goes along, we're going to learn more and more. But it's interesting how in such a short period of time, mm -hmm. we've gone from saying Alzheimer's disease is a disease that's not preventable. And the reason that was of interest to me, of course, is that African-Americans are at greater risk for Alzheimer's mm -hmm. than most mm -hmm. other group. And so when you say it's not preventable, you get me upset. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I'm, I've been working to show that it is preventable. Mm -hmm. But we've got to also demonstrate how we're preventing it and working with our children mm -hmm. and uh, making sure that they get the nutrition uh, and the education that it takes to prevent Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. I know that at least part of your early motivation and your inspiration came from hearing stories of almost the almost fatal case of the whooping cough. You, you had when you were two years old. And, I, and I, I've been in the trenches reading about you, Dr. Satchel. So you may not know enough about me, but I've learned some things about you. And I know that that is what inspired you to become a physician and started you on this journey. But I'm very, very grateful that, you know, even at your age and, and in our conversation, you say, well, I, I'm going swimming, I'm going to do this. And I look down at myself and say, oh, I need to be walking two miles. So irregardless of whether it was you in the trenches uh, changing things around disparities, it's just overall health. I know that you've been committed to that fight. But I, but I think a lot of people who will be listening to this interview will be wondering, what has really kept you on this journey? What has kept you inspired and kept you searching for innovation and plowing through all of those obstacles to make things happen and just prefer, uh, just trying to change an imperfect world? Well, I think I've been fortunate really to um, have had the opportunity to know and to work with some really outstanding and caring people, starting with my parents, mm -hmm. uh, neither of whom finished elementary school, but uh, my father somehow became superintendent of the Sunday school and served in that position for 25 years. And my mother, who taught my father how to read, mm. uh, taught Sunday school. She was, they made the best of what they had. So I didn't grow up thinking I could make excuses for what I didn't have, because I grew up around people who were determined to make the best of what they had. Mm -hmm. And so together, we, we made things work on that 40-acre farm that we had. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and that's been my attitude throughout my life is that I have a responsibility to make the best of what I have, not to just complain about what I didn't have. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also know the importance of fighting for what you should have when you don't have it. Mm -hmm. And that's what, that's what Morehouse was about. That's what our student movement was about. Um, and then when I got to medical school, of course, totally different environment, came from a overwhelmingly predominantly black college, Morehouse, to go to a medical school where in most of my classes, I was the only African-American. So I, I learned to, to survive in these different environments and to develop relationships that can make a difference, not just for me, but for other people as well. Yes, sir. And I have one more question because I know that on this journey, there have been times that you've gotten weary and even I'm just getting started. And as I look at all those grandiose deliverables that I put in that grant, sometimes I'm already becoming a little discouraged, but, but, I'm, but I'm committed to stay in the fight. But what do you see, Dr. Satcher, as the deepest traps we might fall into on this journey? Places where we might lose our way and lose our momentum, or even, you know, there may be times that I may just lose some hope. It's a, the kind of question, obviously, that's not easy to answer. Mm -hmm. But I do think that uh, there, there are a lot of people 
who can help you along the way. Uh, I'm sure you've helped a lot of people already and I think we succeed because we continue to help each other. Um, uh, you've done a great thing by bringing this uh, program here. It, it, it significantly elevates uh, Morehouse School of Medicine and the Atlanta University Center. Mm -hmm. And so, but don't be afraid to continue to seek support mm -hmm. from people here in the Atlanta University Center, beginning with the Morehouse School of Medicine. Um, when I left the Office of Surgeon General uh, in uh, 2002, I had an agreement already that I was going to go to Stanford. And Stanford already had a community health center. It was already funded. Mm -hmm. And so I, I felt really good about that. Uh, um, and then I got a call from, from Dr. Sullivan, mm -hmm. who said, Dave, uh, we're trying to develop a national center for primary care here. And, but they say that the only way they can fund it is that we have a national leader to lead the center. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, I was already packed to go to Stanford. I couldn't say no to Morehouse. Mm -hmm. I came here in 2002 and, mm -hmm. and they wanted me to serve as uh, interim president for three or four months. Well, that turned out to be two years. <laughs> <laughs> and it was during that time, of course, that I realized that we need to be developing leaders. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I would have sessions with all of the leaders, department chairs, vice president, and we talk about leadership. We read books about leadership. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a major ex um, step forward for us as a group. And then uh, of course, uh, when I finally left the office of the president, I decided that I didn't want to go back to the National Center for Primary Care. Mm -hmm. because we had some good people there. They had taken over and they had done a good job. So I didn't want to replace them. Mm -hmm. and, you know, Dr. Russ, George Russ? Yes, sir. He was my boss for quite some time. Okay. Well, he was my deputy. And when I left, I left him in charge. He did a great job. Mm -hmm. So I decided that even though I could go back and take over, that um, the National Center for Primary Care was doing great. So I wanted to look for something else. And that's when we decided to start the Satchel Health Leadership Institute. Very momentous times at Morehouse School of Medi Medicine that has really created the history that we have here now. And I know, Dr. Satchel, I've asked a lot of questions, but I would be remiss if I did not remind uh, or let viewers know about your new book, My Quest for Health, Notes on Learning While Leading. Yes, sir. Can you hold that one up for me, Dr. Satchel? So I'm going to have to get me a signed copy of that. I'm surprised you don't have one. No, sir, I don't have one of those. I'm going to have to get me a signed copy now. All the information that I have, I pulled it off the internet, but I'm going to get that because that's a good read and it should be in the center. You want to just give us to tell us a little bit just about that before we wrap up, Dr. Satcher? Yeah, in part, this was, you know, I don't know if you're aware, my wife died of uh, Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Well, less, less than two years ago. And, uh, but it was during her, the latter part of her illness, you know, when she really couldn't communicate, that I decided that I want to begin to put some things in writing mm -hmm. you know, about my life and our lives, life together. So I started writing this book. Mm -hmm. And the rest mm -hmm. is this history. So I want all my viewers to get out and, and get that book. But, uh, but also, I just want to say thank you, Dr. Satcher. I know there are a thousand and three other questions that I could have asked you, but I want to be mindful of your time. And I just wanted it to just really have an opportunity to, to listen, to sit at your feet, and just to really get to know you and to make you a part of our center. I know that you're not at the university as often as you used to be, but I just did, I would have been remiss if I didn't make you a part of this center. So this is my way. Um, I'm getting, getting a little teary-eyed, but this is my way of saying thank you for your service. Service. 
Thank you for being a part of Morehouse School of Medicine. And thank you for indirectly mentoring me to be a woman who is on a quest for a fight. And I want to learn as I lead. And I thank you. So I hope that you found this to be worthwhile. And I just hope that as you continue to peel about every day, that you're just equally as proud of the center as we are. So I do thank you for your time. I'm looking forward to watching you develop and being supportive when I can. Yes, sir. So good luck. Thank you. Thank you so kindly. That means a lot. Thank you. All right, take care.